Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, as always, I just want to welcome you on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself in the wonderful, the precious, the glorious, the awesome name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm, I'm so glad that you can join us for this time in the Word as we continue on. And this is our third part, and I'm assuming the final part, of our look at the incident. This sounds like the incident in the Valley of Allah when David met Goliath. Hallelujah. This is a historical account of a tremendous event that too much of the church has torn, turned into a children's story. That's right. And I want to tell you something. This is a powerful story of how the men of God need to learn to live. Amen. I'm glad I got to say that. Yes. So we're going to get back in and pick up where we left off. And, but before we do, Brother Mark is going to ask for God's blessing on our time together in his word. It says in Psalms 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Oh, that we may live that verse mm -hmm. and have that to heart. Mm -hmm. And Lord, may what we hear today be, a, be on the path to that, ver that verse. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That should be, that's a, a great goal that we should all have. Great desire. It should be our desire. Our only desire. You know, I, I'm just reminded before I start of that wonderful, wonderful, wonderful old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. When you do, the things of earth will grow strangely dim when you look full in his eyes, I'll tell you what. Amen. So, Lord, do it. Amen. Use this time. All right. We left off what we were talking about. Uh, again, we're, we're in First Samuel chapter 17, and we were talking about uh, David, when he first went out on the battlefield, how Goliath had put a curse on him. Mm -hmm. Now, that, you know, I, here in the States, in the United States, I, I see people running around saying, well, you know, you've got to be careful, you've got a curse put on you and everything. We've spent time in Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mark has been with us in West Africa. I've been over in East Africa and Alice. This is uh, something very, very serious over there. Because, for example, we spent time together in Cameroon. Uh, and in Cameroon, I think, I, I'm, the statistics may be off now a little bit, but it's probably close to it. It was about 40% Christian, 40% Muslim, and 20% absolute pagan. Now, pagan there doesn't just mean, well, you're not a Christian, you go to church. No. These are actively pagan worshipers. Yes. Witchcraft. And there's so much witchcraft. And when we went there, we, we found so many Christians so concerned because these witch doctors mm -hmm. would be putting curses on the, on the church, on people in the church. Uh, the fact is, David had a curse put on him by Goliath. And all I can say is, how'd that work out for him? It just rolled off. Rolled off. As well it should. Amen. You know, we talked about it. It says, you know, in Isaiah, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Jesus has broken the curse, all right? Yes. So we were talking about that. Now, I, I just wanted to, before we went into the next verses, you know the account in Numbers 23, 22, 23, of Balaam and Balak. Mm -hmm. When Balak, the king, wanted to hire Balaam to go put a curse mm. on the people of Israel as they were passing through the land. And God spoke to Balaam, had to speak to him through a donkey. He was a little, little hard-headed, eh? But he said, God, and this is what Balaam reported back to the king. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. As God told him, you go bless the people. Mm -hmm. And what he has blessed, I cannot revoke. Amen. Who do you think exists here on earth, heaven or hell, whose word is more powerful than the word of God? None. 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 
So there is not a there is not a human being or a demon alive who can curse me with with words that will undo the words of God That's in my life. That's right. And you know what he said to me? He said, You're precious in my sight. Hallelujah. You're mine. And I love You're you. A Amen. We need to start to learn to walk in, in the promises of God and act upon them. Okay. So anyhow, when he gets out there, now now get this picture in your mind. David has gone out where no no Hebrew would go onto the battlefield with this giant David. Mm -hmm. And in, in 1 Samuel 17, 44, it says, The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give you a flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. I'm going to kill you dead. Now that's a paraphrase. But it's pretty accurate. That's what they, that's what Goliath was saying to David. I'm going to kill you dead. Mm -hmm. Could he do it? No. Well, let me just tell you this. A lot of Christians have died for their faith. Yes. yes. Okay? Is that not true? Yes. A lot of Christians have died for their Mart faith. Martyrs, yes. Could, could Goliath kill him? Well, here's what I'm, I'm going to... you you got to work with me and appraise things spiritually. Jesus Christ said that we are not to fear those who can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Yes. There are people out there who are able to kill the body. And you want to know something? Even if they don't kill the body, it says that this outward man, this flesh, is perishing. Mm -hmm. Day by day. But the inner man is being renewed day by day. Okay? I'm, I'm sitting here. Watch me, look at me closely. I'm perishing right before your eyes. <laughs> Hallelujah. On my way to glory. <laughs> and I, this is not a joking matter. And, and there's a reason I bring this up. Um, this past, as we're doing this, it was just recently that a, a demented, deranged man walked into a church in Sutherland Springs, Texas. And opened fire with an automatic weapon or semi-automatic weapon. And just started killing the Christians who were there inside, had, had gathered, this congregation had gathered to fellowship together, to worship together, to pray together. And here this deranged man comes in and starts picking them up, slaughtering them. Mm -hmm. I think it was 26 people were killed and 20 some odd, injured. 20 injured, wounded. This is not a joking matter. And certainly it's a horrific event until, until the church begins to triumphantly shout and proclaim the glory of God's word in the midst of the horror. Have you never heard? For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immoral, immortality. Mm -hmm. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, oh death, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Where? I, you know, certainly it's a tragedy. But somewhere, someplace in the church, Somebody has to stand up and shout hallelujah. You can kill their body, but you want to know something? They are alive and well. That's right. We are different in the world. We need to be different in the world. We need to act different in the world. You know, <clears throat> the victor is not determined until... The battle is over. That's right. Right? Well, it's true. And on the cross, talking about Jesus in John 19, 30, it says, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It, it is, is finished. finished. The victory was done. It was over. It was the battle was over. Mm -hmm. Now, it may appear to the world, it was loss. Mm -hmm. It says, the next part of that verse is, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
Amen. I don't know if you know this. I trust you do. He is alive. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the rest of the story. You know, a lot of times, I just say this, there's a lot of things you can face the, the enemy with. And when you're being attacked by the enemy, and, and, and uh, I got to be really prayerful how I say this. No, you got to be really prayerful how you receive it. I pray that you're in the battle. Mm -hmm. well, because if you're not, that means he's probably not concerned about you. Yeah. But when he does, you can say a lot of things. There are a lot of things that you should say. You should be giving thanks. You should be praising the Lord. But one of the things you can do, you can look the enemy straight in the eyes and say this. He is risen. Thank you, Lord. He is risen. Hallelujah. So, the battle is over, and we are on the winning side. It doesn't matter. You know, it says in, uh, help me out here, in Ecclesiastes, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. Okay? It can look pretty terrible in the middle. But you got to wait till the end. You got to wait to see how it turns out. I, I just, I, I thought of something just before we started, and I mentioned it to Alice. Have you ever heard of the Heidi Ball? Yes. You did. You did. Hmm. Okay. I, I, I can, I probably safely assume that a, on quite a number of people listening to this right now or watching this may not be at least intimately familiar with the Heidi Bowl. The Heidi Bowl was a football game between the New York Jets and the Oakland Raiders mm -hmm. in 1968, 49 yes. years ago. Uh, because Alice and I were very intimately acquainted, involved with the New York Jets at the time. My mother worked for the New York Jets. As a matter of fact, that game took place a week before Thanksgiving mm -hmm. in, in 1968, and we had dinner with the team. Thanksgiving dinner. Thanksgiving dinner with the team, that, like, like a week later. But here's the point. The Heidi Bowl, now this was a very important time because for, the, for football, because it was the end of the season, and typically by around Thanksgiving time, it was determined who would win the title for each division, the AFL and the NFL. And that would determine who was going into the Super Bowl. Well, the fact was, if you'll excuse me one minute. <coughs> Thank you. The fact was, the, the New York Jets were in heavy contention to go to the Super Bowl. So here in this game, it would pretty much determine whether they went or not, or pretty close to it. The Jets were walloping the Oakland Raiders. And at the end of the game, the Jets were ahead by, I don't remember, by, by uh, quite a bit, okay? And because the time had run short for the television, it was carried by NBC. They cut the game off with like a minute to go. Or maybe two minutes to go. Because this movie, Heidi, was coming on. So they cut that... They, now, remember, the Jets are pretty well ahead. There's only two minutes left to play. So they turn the game off and turn on the Heidi, the movie. Well, come to find out, because so many people complained, they put the movie... They, Oakland scored two touchdowns, two touchdowns in the last minute of the game yeah. and won the game. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with football or with American football, <coughs> But, I mean, that's pretty astounding. Yes. It's a 60-minute game contest, and after 59 minutes of, of this contest, the Jets are well ahead. They certainly the, look like the winners. They, they, they are, yeah, they're winning this game. The television goes off. Oakland scored two touchdowns in the last one minute mm -hmm. and won the game. You want to know something? I don't care what it looks like. And I, I can promise you, based on what the Word of God says, it's going to look bad yes. at the very end. Because you want to know something? There won't be any believers. Yeah. Well, there'll be two. Two witnesses, yes. There'll be the two witnesses. But the world will be, you know, all of the believers are gone. Mm -hmm. There's only two le left, the two witnesses, the two prophets of God, and Oh, the world hates them. Yes. So they are killed in Jerusalem. Looking bad for the church. 
until God raises the two witnesses from the dead. You know what? It's not over till it's over. There was a, a Yankee catcher. His name was Yogi Berra. You may have heard of him. Mm-hmm. He was well known for his sayings. Mm-hmm. And one of his famous sayings was, it ain't over till it's over. <laughs> That's right. Whatever's going on in your life, I promise you, God is in control and you will come out victorious. God will choose how it happens, when it happens, but you will come out victorious if you stand firm in your faith. That's the truth. Just stay focused on him. Absolutely. Keep your eyes. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, okay? Okay. Remember, so so talking about those people, and I, I uh, again, this is a difficult thing to talk about because I don't see this attitude in too much of the church, okay? You don't celebrate the death of a Christian. You celebrate the life of a Christian. And you celebrate the eternal life of a Christian. That the death has no victory. Death has been defeated. Well, we need to stand up and proclaim that in front of the world. Yes. And I don't see that happening. Mm. Yes, maybe we have to proclaim it through tears. Maybe we have to proclaim it through the pain. But we need to proclaim that those 26 believers in a church in Texas are not dead. They are alive. Not, they are alive. Alive with Christ Jesus. To be absent from the, from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said, and if you don't know memorized verses, maybe you want to memorize this one. Jesus said to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, when he went to the tomb, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. John eleven twenty nine. 29. Mm-hmm. You can't kill me. You can't kill me. And I'm not about to commit spiritual suicide. Okay. So let's get back to David and Goliath here. In verse 45, 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. Now remember, Goliath has just cursed David. Mm -hmm. But David says to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, And I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the skies and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Israel, I have a love for Israel, but I want to tell you, You had better put your trust in the Lord God Almighty. It's not a matter, you know, I I remember when the war was going on with Lebanon. How long ago was that? How many years ago was that? Was that 1986? No, no, Lebanon, I think it was in the 2000, 2000, early 2000s, I I think. I wrote a letter, an email to the Knesset, Mm. because they were not doing as well as one had expected. And I said, "You, you really ought to pay attention to the strategy of the greatest military leader that you ever had. And the greatest military leader, and they've had some brilliant ones, but I'm not talking about Moshe Dayan, I'm not talking about Menachem Begin. The greatest one is David, Mm -hmm. without fact. And and no Jewish person should ever debate that fact. But David said, it's the Lord's. If the battle is the Lord's, then the victory will be the Lord's. God will give you into our hands. Mm -hmm. Israel, don't trust in your weapons, your strength. Don't trust in the assistance of America or your other out. Trust in the Lord your God so that you can walk in true victory. Thank okay. David was aggravated. Is that the right word? He was agitated. He was upset by the words of Goliath. He had Spirit, a righteous anger. Spiritually provoked. Spiritually provoked. And that's, you know... It says, be angry and yet do not sin. Mm-hmm. There is such a thing as a righteous anger. Righteous anger, by the way, has to, has the one clue about righteous anger. It's never about something done to you. Right. Okay? Righteous anger is about something that's happening to somebody else. And when you see God being maligned like that. Mocked. Mocked. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, that, that's what happened with David here, okay? Do you never get provoked that the Lord God Almighty is taunted and mocked by the people around you? And if you do, has it ever led to action on your part? Mm. I was thinking about that. Now, it's getting more and more difficult, what I'm going to tell you right now, because of the times we live in. But the simple fact is, I can remember when Alice and I first got married, we were in a restaurant and we were having dinner. And we were sitting there in this restaurant and at a table a couple of feet away from us, a few feet away from us, there were four fellows sitting there. And this one fellow just kept saying, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Remember that? And I got up and I walked over to him. And I said, listen, can I, do you mind if I ask you a question? And he said, no. I said, I just wondered if you were praying or cursing. I said, if you're praying, I'd like to join you. If you're cursing, I'll pray for you. He stopped. Mm-hmm. Now, that can get you, without doubt, a punch in the nose. That, so wasn't, that wasn't when we were just married. Was it? No. When we were saved when you said that. Oh, that's true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for a suitable helpmate. It wasn't when we were just married. No. It was after we were saved, yes. That's right. But the fact of the matter is, it, it's so blatant, the, the abuse, the lack of a fear of the Lord in our culture and society today, you would spend all of your time trying to chase Goliaths. Mm. But somehow you have to be led by the Spirit of God and open to being used by God. If God tells you, go say something. Go do something. And if you have to do something, don't be afraid of the consequence. Okay? David, he wasn't afraid of he wasn't afraid of Goliath. He wasn't afraid of the lions. He wasn't afraid of the bears. He knew God was his rear guard. And how did he know that? Because, because he had been living it. That's right. When you start to live the word of God, I'm going to tell you it'll be put to the test. Yes. The devil doesn't like any Christians, but he has a pure hatred for Christians who walk in faith. And he will try you. He will test you. And you know what that'll wind up with? A testimony that will bring glory to God. That's what it'll do. Uh, Remember, you you have to believe in your heart, but you also have to confess with your mouth, right? That's what Paul wrote in, in Romans. He said, for the heart, a person believes resulting in righteousness. And with a mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation, Romans 10, 10. So it's like when, you, you, when you're confessing the word of God, that brings God into action. <laughs> so in verse 48, it says, Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. I think one of the most wonderful things in the world is that word, rose. Yes. Then it happened when the Philistine rose. Do you get this? You know, we have to have a little <clears throat> reading comprehension. If the Philistine rose when David said this, you know what that means? He was sitting down before. Yeah. He didn't take it very serious. He didn't take he, David very serious. He was not. Yeah. He wasn't just. He didn't take the whole situation. No, no, but he wasn't taking David. That was the yeah. point. I mean, you know. It, said the other ones didn't confront him at all. Yeah. They just made a lot of noise. He, he's specifically talking about David. He said, you know, you come here, you're a youth, you're nothing. Yeah. I'm going to, you know, he cursed them. And the fact of the matter is, it's like he he had no regard for David. Yeah. And, and from, a, from a worldly, natural point of view, I can understand that. Yeah. Goliath is this monster warrior. And here comes Champion. a young guy, yeah. no armor on, no nothing, doesn't have a sword, doesn't have a shield, doesn't have armor on. And Goliath, he's just sitting down relaxing. Yeah. Until, until... David said to him, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And then Goliath knew he was in for a fight. Goliath knew he was in for a fight. So he rose up. He rose up. And when he rose up, what happened with David? David charged. Ran toward him. He was letting the devil know he was in for a fight. Yeah. The whole armor of God. Now, God is your rear guard. But the whole armor of God, it's got your head covered Right? It's got your heart covered. Right. It's got your... You know what it doesn't have? It's not, it doesn't have your back covered. Mm. We're not supposed to run away from the fight. Yeah. Now, you know, we're, we serve a God of peace. We serve the Prince, Prince of Peace. Yes. We're not supposed to go out looking for battles. We're not supposed to be contentious. 
We're not supposed to be looking for fights. But when the fight arises, we are supposed to be prepared. That's right. And not run away from it. Okay. I, I just, I, I, that strikes me so greatly. I mean, it's like, can, if you can picture that. All of a sudden, Goliath knows that he's in for a fight. He gets up, it's serious. How did he know it was serious? Because of the words of David. Yes. Do your words scare the devil? Does your confession scare the enemy? Does he know that you're serious? Or does he think, well, you're just, you know, you're, you're a kid out there playing Christian. You can dress up. You can go out and you can shout the war cry. We talked about this a lot in the last mm -hmm. two weeks. But until the enemy sees that you take the Lord seriously, right. he's not going to take you seriously. Because he, he saw what David believed. He heard what David believed. I want to say that one more time, okay? Because I really, until you take the Lord seriously, mm -hmm. the enemy will not take, take you seriously. seriously. Mm -hmm. So, verse 49 says, And David put his hand into the bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in David's hand. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. He threw a rock at him. That's right. It wasn't just a stone. No, it, it was, was a rock. rock. I, was, I was thinking the same thing. A rock that is higher than I. The rock of my salvation. Amen. Because there's no enemy that can stand against the rock. That's right. Hallelujah. It was the rock who is the word. Because and he's, so, because he said that was it was the Lord's battle. It was the battle. The battle was the Lord's. That's right. So I said that we would finish up. I didn't fib, but I wasn't accurate because oh. we're not going to finish up quite oh, yet. Okay. All right. I want you to, to think. You got a homework assignment. Yeah. Think about the state of the church today and the attack of the enemy that is going on everywhere. Yeah. Yes. Okay, there may not be a Goliath, but there are a lot of giants out there attacking the church. <clears throat> you may have a lot of giant looking situations that are attacking you. God has a plan for you to deal with it. So I don't know if you know how this turned out. <laughs> but be back next week and you'll find out it's for exciting sure. Exciting conclusion. Okay, for the exciting conclusion. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you are the Prince of Peace and the Mighty Warrior. And Lord, that you love us and we are precious in your sight. We praise you and thank you, Lord God, that you have us in the palm of your hand where no man can snatch us out. And we thank you above all that your gift to us, Father, has been eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise you and thank oh, you for that in Jesus' name. Jesus. Well, till next week, God bless you and goodbye. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind.